So hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spagan, and I'm a Vice President at the Jefferson and am a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. One thing I can't claim to be, however, is a Bay Rat, but my guest here proudly can. Dr. David Frew, a prolific writer, author, speaker, grew up on Erie's Lower West Side as a proud Bay Rat, joining neighborhood kids playing and marauding all along the West Bay front. He has written for years about his beloved Presque Isle and his adventures on the Great Lakes. In a new series of articles for the Jefferson Educational Society, this retired professor takes, on, uh, takes note of life in and around the water. And that is what we're here to discuss, to discuss today. Of course, uh, aside from being a Bay Rat, Dr. Frew is an historian and an author and emeritus professor at Gannon University, where he held a variety of administrative positions during a 33-year-long career. He's also an emeritus director of the Erie County Historical Society, now the Hagen History Center, and is president of his own management consulting business. Uh, Dr. Frew has written or co-written 35, count them, 35 books and more than 100 articles, cases, and papers. Now, we're going to talk about some of those today. We're excited to dig in, but since this program is first airing live on the Jefferson's Facebook page, uh, we're going to work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you do have a question, just leave it in the comment section below, and we'll work through those. If you happen to be watching a later broadcast, uh, please do feel free to send us questions, and we'll get them along to Dr. Fru as best as we can. And of course, for more information about upcoming Jefferson Educational Society programs and publications, please visit our website, jeserie.org. And be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Dr. David Fru, thank you for joining me for this discussion. Thanks for having me. This is fun. So, Dr. Frew, I grabbed my dictionary, but it's got to be a faulty copy, because when I do turn to the bees and I look for the definition of bay rat, I can't seem to find it anywhere. For others like me with bummed dictionaries, uh, could you define what exactly a bay rat is, please? I can. Uh, maybe 20 years ago, I had the insight myself. A friend of mine, a Portuguese kid from the neighborhood and one of my good buddies, uh, stopped to see me uh, when I was at the Historical Society with a photograph of uh, five of us. And there we were wearing dungarees, not jeans, gray, beat up, ripped, and tattered, and once white shirts, which had somehow turned gray and brown, and ripped and tattered. And our hair looked like somebody had dipped us in the water and let it air dry, which kind of is exactly what happened. And he said, now you know why they call us bay rats. Look at us. We look like drowned rats. There we were, the five of us. <laughs> so I love that description. That's how you've been introducing yourself in uh, a wonderful series uh, on the waterfront uh, that you've been writing for us uh, here at the Jefferson uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic um, as great reading material for folks looking for uh, something to plug into while many of us are, are at home, social distancing, working from home largely interacting through our computer screens. Uh, all of those are available online at the Jefferson's website, jeserie.org. We're gonna work our way through some of those uh, that I wanna to touch on today. For folks that maybe haven't had a chance to read them, I wanna discuss them here today, or really unpack some of the stories behind the stories. Uh, but in one of your most recent ones, uh, we find ourselves uh, at the Chestnut Pool. Uh, <laughs> we learn of things uh, like Boys Day versus Girls Day, public transportation, interesting public transportation. Have to be fair. Uh, the prospect of losing friends to faraway cities along rail lines. Take us to that scene to the Chestnut Pool. Well, Chestnut Pool was an incredible spot for all of us kids. It was a concrete pool. It was probably not very sophisticated. And one of the side effects of time spent in the, in the Chestnut Pool, or a Bay Rat Country Club, as we called it, uh, was bloody feet uh, from walking on the walking on the concrete, and we often went there uh, on boys' days. Every other day was boys' days, and they used used to rotate the weeks. So one week would be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and the next week would be Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And my now wife Marianne went there as well, but we didn't know each other back then. So I've got to ask, did you meet her there? Did you meet her at the Chestnut Pole or did you meet her later somewhere else other than the Chestnut Pole? I met her at Beach Six. I laid, on, I laid eyes on her for the first time. She was the vision of Annette Funicello at Beach Six when I was a senior in high school. <laughs> what a great eerie love story. Uh, let's back up to the start of the Waterfront series. Um, 
you know, like I said, you, you started this uh, right as uh, the Jefferson was closing its doors. We made the announcement we were going to work through the pandemic and figure out what a digital Jefferson would look like. And uh, we began pivoting some of our programming. We began ramping up our publications division um, under the great stewardship of uh, Pat Cunio there. And uh, David, you came to us and said, would you like some things? And uh, we started reading them and you started sending us more and more. Every time I read it, uh, now that you've built up a canon with more than a dozen features on the, on the website and others filed in the works being edited, worked on right now, they're a ton of fun to read, but it seems like you're having a ton of fun writing them. Are you having fun? Tell us about your calling to telling these stories and the excitement, the passion, what draws you there? Well, I'm, I'm bunkered here as well. And the, 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 uh, the virus has uh, changed my life. Um, Marianne was an infection control nurse. She's a nurse and a university professor nurse for much of her career. And uh, we're probably more cautious than the average person. We have a, a, a terribly scary comorbidity. We're old. So we're the kind of people would get this and end up on a ventilator the next week. Uh, I was looking for something fun to do, and uh, it's, it's really fun for me to write. So we already found out about one of the loves of your life, Marianne, who you met on Beach Six, and uh, you were there with her working on programming, working on publications for us. One of the other love affairs that you talk about is yours with loons, uh, and you say that one began 25 years ago when you sailed uh, 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 from Erie to the uh, Georgian Bay. Um, a few things. You call loons uh, one of Lake Erie's most beautiful birds, and you talk about uh, the recordings of their calls. I think that's a really interesting part of that particular write-up. Uh, tell us a bit about how your love affair started and uh, your CD collection when it comes to listening to loons. Well, I, I met a fellow by the name of Don Gibson at, uh, at Killarney, which is in the heart of the Georgian Bay. It's just a gorgeous place. In fact, I, I recommend that as soon as we're allowed to go back to Canada, uh, which who knows when that will be, October or November, maybe, if we're lucky. Uh, everyone should take a trip up to the Georgian Bay. And the two places that everyone should visit would be Tobermory and Killarney. There are lots of other places as well. And there I was at Killarney and happy to have made that trip. It's not a, not a, not a fast way to travel. It was six days to get there by boat, nonstop. We spent one overnight in a port, but the rest of the time we're traveling at six, seven knots, uh, you don't go all that fast. And uh, here I run into a guy that has the very same boat that I have, and he was complaining that he had no idea how to change his oil. He couldn't get anybody to change the oil for him. And I said, well, I know how to do that. I have the same boat you have. This turned out to be a fellow by the name of Don Gibson. He was a university professor of English. And uh, in the summers, he would go up to uh, the Georgian Bay with sophisticated recording equipment and make recordings of uh, surf, winds and waves and birds, and then he would print those into uh, classical music. Uh, his series was called Solitudes, it's still available. And uh, after I helped him change his oil, uh, he handed me the, the loon recording. And so uh, your on the waterfront pieces aren't just limited when it, when it comes to birds, they're not just limited to loons. Uh, you've also written about um, ospreys and ducks, uh, the latter walking on fish. And I've been where you're talking about, and I think that's one of the most interesting, I think that's the word I'm going to stick to, interesting places I've ever been uh, taken. Let's start there, though. For those who have not seen uh, ducks walk on fish, uh, David, where does that happen? Well, it happens at Pine Tuning, uh, which is a place which uh, has come to attract a zillion people like myself that generally so I overgo there by myself, of course. It's always taking children or grandchildren. Wink, wink. And when you get there, you can buy uh, old bread for like $7 a loaf or whatever. And uh, you, throw the, you throw the bread in the air and before the ducks can grab it, uh, the carp are sort of slithering around trying to grab it away from them. It's kind of fun, especially when you think about the fact that uh, carp is not a native fish. It's an invasive. It was brought here um, to help us solve the problem of disappearing whitefish in the Great Lakes. A terrible mistake, by the way. And, and I was going to say, give us a, a, a just a quick pulse check on that, because I, when we hear of invasive species in Erie, we think of, um, you know, we, we often hear zebra mussels and we hear carps, you know, when we hear a couple of other, but I think the Asian carp is what uh, people tend to think of the most nationally when it comes to an invasive species in our region. How are we doing in Lake Erie with that invasive species? 
Well, I have a daughter who's a marine biologist, and uh, she helps inform me on much of this stuff. There's a, a swamp slash wetland at the end of Lake Erie. It's called the Great Black Swamp. It's uh, 100 miles long and 25,000 miles wide, and uh, people have been working since the Civil War to try to uh, tile it uh, agriculturally so it can become a productive farmland. And what's happened to Lake Erie is it's suffering because it's lost its most important wetland. And it's also the place where two, the two watersheds come together. Uh, Asian carp were, uh, were purchased uh, by uh, fish farmers down south during the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, people raising uh, catfish, which is the most common down south raised uh, fish. And you can take two uh, Asian carp that you can buy and they'll send them to you in, a, in an aquarium. <laughs> they're, they're really tough. And throw them in your catfish farm. And uh, those guys will clear out all the algae in a week or two. And of course, farmers typically, when somebody says you should buy two and that'll be fine, they'll buy six or seven or eight. And then we had a high water event in the 1990s uh, when uh, the water got too high and the Asian carp escaped and they got out of the, cat, the catfish farms and got into the Mississippi River and they're relentlessly heading toward Lake Erie. Now, we know that the Asian carp DNA is in Lake Erie. We've not seen an Asian carp yet. And we know that the Asian carp is in the Great Black Swamp, where the two watersheds come together. It's, it's very frightening. And those are the guys that can grow to be 80, 90 pounds. Uh, there's two varieties. One gets 80, 90 pounds, and the other is a little, or 40 or 50 pounds. And something good that's happening is in Illinois, they're starting to harvest those and uh, sell them as meat. Yeah, and I think uh, for those who have seen uh, YouTube videos, you see them jumping, you know, out uh, out of the water, and and sometimes because they're so large and massive, you know, knocking people, you know, off their feet, or even knocking somebody out of a boat into the water. Certainly something we want to keep our eye on, um, you know, here in Erie, and and see the developments, and and maybe follow Illinois' lead in in working to find creative solutions to either uh, deal with them if we get them, but keep them out if we can. David, one of the other things I really appreciate about your writing is how interesting concepts find their way into water-based themes, water-based topics. And one that I can't help but I want to ask you a little bit more about is while you're talking about Osprey, chaos theory ends up being <laughs> tossed into the writing. And, and I don't think that we necessarily would connect the two, uh, the bird with the theory. And so draw the connection between us for us there, David. Well, uh, to, be, to be fair and, and get out of the out of the closet. I'm not a historian by training. I'm an organizational psychologist by training. And prior to becoming an organizational psychologist by training, I was an engineer by training. So I'm, I'm like a math kind of guy. I love math. And uh, whilst I was futzing around in the 1970s and 80s trying to read Esoterica, I stumbled into chaos theory and started to try to read it. And uh, not to oversimplify chaos theory, because I should not do that, uh, the, the earth is a sentient being, a large one, and when it doesn't like what's happening on it, it scratches like uh, a dog scratches fleas. And uh, one argument uh, about the problems of pollution and mismanagement of the planet and overpopulation from the perspective of chaos theory is that um, maybe some of the stuff that's happening to us these days is the uh, earth trying to scratch its fleas off, and we're the fleas. I think I've been called worse, but uh, still not feeling great being called a flea. But uh, it's a really fascinating piece. And I want to encourage folks to, to head to the website who haven't read it, or, or maybe even folks uh, who are looking to revisit it. Um, all of the pieces that we're talking about here with author uh, Dr. David Fru can be found on the Jefferson website at jeserie.org. Um, his observations, his musings, his data, his finding on uh, life in and around uh, Lake Erie and the Great Lakes watershed in and of itself. Uh, David, we've been talking about the birds, but it's not just for the birds, it's for the fish too. And uh, two different pieces that you talk uh, you, that you touch on, um, you talk about uh, uh, the blue pike and the rainbow smelt. Uh, let's start with the pike. It's a, it's a sad I'm, read. I'm, it's old, a tough I'm read. old enough to remember the glory days of blue pike fishing, and I did some myself. Uh, the days when uh, like, uh, like party boats would go out from the public dock, sometimes three times a day. And you'd look out onto the lake, and this is, this is a vision that Jerry Skripsack, my co-author, always speaks about, 
looking out and seeing like a floating city on the water where people were catching blue pike, uh, sometimes without bait, two at a time. There were no limits. We were greedy hogs and pigs. Uh, we've committed the sin one more time of overfishing and uh, the blue pike is gone. And you'll find a half a dozen explanations for the blue pike went. My favorite explanation was that it was the introduction of the invasive rainbow smelt uh, that did in the blue pike. I went to a lecture once in Ontario, um, sponsored by the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources there. There was a biologist uh, from, uh, I believe, Western, Western Ontario, from the University of Western Ontario, that's the Harvard of the North, they call it, uh, talking about, uh, first thing he said is he introduced a picture of the rainbow schmelt. He said if they got to be four feet or five feet long, we wouldn't be able to swim. It would be too dangerous. They'd be like swimming with a barracuda, piranha, and shark. They're so nasty and so aggressive. And where uh, schmelt came from is that uh, sports fishermen in Lake uh, Michigan were trying to reintroduce trout because uh, lake trout, they're fun and big and exciting to catch. And they kept uh, stocking them and they kept dying. And finally they concluded that there was nothing for them to eat in the food chain. Uh, so that's when they went up to Northern Ontario lakes and they found these schmelt and they put them in Lake Michigan. And the schmelt kind of liked Lake Michigan, but they uh, left and they, they liked Lake Erie a lot better. And uh, within 10 or 12 years, uh, they were at risk of just overwhelming the lake. And people that are even younger than me will recall the glory days of smelt fishing when you could go to spotlight to any creek on the lake. And smelt would like to come up the creeks and try to uh, mate uh, in the fall. You could go up there with a light in a basket and you could gather, you know, 100 pounds of smelt in an evening pretty easily. And they're really good to eat. They're fun. Uh, they're mild tasting. In fact, one of the uh, sub industries on, on Lake Erie for years and years and years was uh, to try to rid Lake Erie of schmelt or at least control the population. They introduced a, a limited program of trawling uh, on the Canadian side. So not only do they still net on the Canadian side, they still use gill nets, which is offensive to some people, uh, but they have a trawling program as well. And the only fish they're allowed to catch in a trawl is a schmelt. And uh, the schmelt have uh, largely, at the beginning, were largely exported to Japan, uh, where comes the, the famous Stan Rogers song. Google this one up and listen to it on YouTube. A Tiny Fish for Japan by Schmelt, or sorry, by Stan Rogers. Uh, that's the story of him sitting in, the, in, the, in, the, in a bar in the North Pacific Tavern in Port Dover, uh, moaning and bemusing the changes in the fishing industry with fishermen who were uh, just sad because the fish they used to love to catch, the blue pike, the yellow pike, the white fish, the cisco, uh, were gone. And uh, now they were, uh, they were forced to go trawling smelt and then sending their catch to Japan. So David, that's not the first time uh, you've told us, go Google something. Uh, you actually did that in one of your pieces. And uh, you, know, you said that uh, actually Googling this thing, I'm gonna ask you what this thing is, uh, pander, quote, panders to your passion, and it's of ship spotting. Uh, many of us, you know, as we're continuing to social distance, um, our, our view of the world is through the window of our computer screens. Give us a, a quick uh, ship spotting 101 lesson. Tell us what to Google there and how we can explore the great wide world while we're staying at home. Well, you have the link, I believe, uh, that you've shared with everyone. Uh, you can go to that link. If I recall, it's... Uh, Charlevoyweather.com. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and put that uh, in, in the link right below um, uh, for the comment section on Facebook. Uh, so we'll include that. And it's in your feature. Sorry to interrupt you, David. We do have that link for you. I don't think it's weather. I think it's Upper Great Lakes shipping locations. And that's when, the uh, that's what to Google, and it takes you right there. So it takes you right there. Done. But you're gonna you're gonna pop up in Lake Michigan and wonder what you're doing in Lake Michigan. But you'll see that you can toggle across the screen, and uh, what you'll be able to see with this, you can go from Lake Superior to Lake Michigan to Lake Erie to Lake Huron, and you can see every ship uh, that's actively moving around or actively working on the Great Lakes. In fact. If you keep going, uh, you can go out into the Atlantic and watch the ships going up and down the eastern coast. And uh, any ship that's uh, someplace working, it might be uh, loading or unloading, 
uh, or trawling someplace just uh, sort of waiting to get into unload in a port, uh, you could click on that ship with your mouse and uh, the transporter on top of the ship will tell you the name of the ship, give you pictures, tell you what it's carrying, where it's going, how fast it's going, where it's come from. It's just great, great fun. And if you're a uh, ship nerd like myself uh, and you get up every morning and drive around the peninsula and go for a walk and look over to see what ships are in the harbor, uh, sometimes you'll be able to learn something about the ships that are here. For me, it was the first time I was ever doing that. I'll admit, uh, I ended up down a rabbit hole for at least a good half hour, maybe longer, checking it out. So I uh, strongly encourage people to do that. Speaking of ships, though, one of the quotes you've got from a piece is, uh, quote, ordinarily a news story about a, sh a submarine. So we're using ships here as a big blanket term here. A news story about a submarine would uh, make the average person think about the Atlantic Ocean, World War II, or even modern times. You wrote in a piece called uh, Strange Headline for 1853, Submarine Sinks Offshore. Uh, that was a piece you did for us in May. Uh, as strange as it may seem, that submarine went down in Lake Erie. David, what the heck was a submarine doing in Lake Erie? Well, during the uh, pre-Civil War era, uh, the ship you wanted to travel on because it was fun and amusing with wealthy people traveled on it just for sport was one of the uh, upper cabin steamships that went roaring back and forth between Buffalo and Detroit. People just took that ride because it was exciting. You could ride first class, second class, like, like you and I on a trip on an airplane, or, or steerage class in the barn. So we had these ships uh, carrying people and cargo back and forth. It wasn't uh, bulk cargo like we have these days. It was uh, package cargo. If you wanted to send something to your friends in, in Detroit or in Chicago, uh, you could uh, send box. So uh, 1852, I'm thinking, uh, I'm not perfect with dates, so it's plus or minus a year. Uh, the steamer Atlantic is heading from Buffalo to Detroit. Uh, and they're for the first time carrying a safe uh, on behalf of two guys whose names were Wells and Fargo, who were the president and COO of American Express, who had the genius idea of moving, moving their shipments along faster by putting them on these ships. And of course, on their, on their inaugural ship, the ship uh, had a collision right off of Erie, close to Long Point, actually, she's in Canadian water. And she went down in 165 feet of water, took a bunch of people with her, and that's safe. Now, not to dehumanize the story and forget about all the, all the people that passed away, uh, the safe attracted a lot of attention. And uh, Wells and Fargo commissioned a deep sea diver by the name of Johnny B. Green, who had no idea how deep the ship was, uh, to go down there and see if he could recover the safe. Uh, he failed, uh, and he got the bends. First time we know of anybody getting the bends. That was when we started to learn about the bends, the disease. Meanwhile, in Michigan City, Indiana, and if you've ever driven to Chicago, you'll drive past Michigan City. That's at the bottom of Lake Superior, and there's a new national park there called Dunes National Park. So Michigan City is a place where you might go and climb up on top of these 100-foot sand dunes, and you can see the skyline of Chicago. It's a great tourist area. There was a fellow there who was the uh, son of a shoe factory owner. His name was Laudner Phillips. And Laudner Phillips uh, was bored working in the shoe factory. He was an inventor and he invented submarines. And his third version of the submarine, which he was frantically trying to sell as a military instrument, and he would have sold it to whoever, including the Confederates at the time, uh, was brought to Erie and uh, went down on the Atlantic to try to recover that safe. Now, anybody that knows the first thing about the depth of the Atlantic or the crudeness of that first submarine would know that there was no real chance that he could have uh, recovered anything from, from that submarine. And here's what happened. Uh, he got here with a submarine and he was thinking Lake Erie was 30 or 40 feet deep. Everybody talks about Lake Erie as being shallow. And he's out over the top of the Atlantic and he learns that it's 165 feet down and he starts to think, hmm. So he gets in the submarine and he's being lowered tenuously and the submarine is filling up with water. So he pulls on the signal rope and comes back to the surface and he says, I think we're gonna try seeing if the submarine could do this without me. So they load the submarine up with uh, building blocks and stuff that were about his weight and they lowered it halfway and the, the cable broke. 
So out there on the site of the Atlantic, which is one of Erie's most sacred shipwrecks these days, is also a uh, Civil War era submarine. It's just fascinating stuff that uh, you were teaching a lot of us, you know, myself included. I, you know, I'm, I'm a non-native to Erie and, and admittedly, um, you know, nowhere close to being a maritime historian. David, I know you said you're not a historian by, by training, but my gosh, uh, it always just marvels me. The people you know, the stories you know, how you retain the details. I know you just said you're not, you know, you're not the best with dates. We're going to forgive you there for everything else you give us. Um, so I, when somebody reached out to me, I thought, if anybody's going to know this, it's going to be David Frew. And, and, and the piece I'm talking about is the, it's a small, small world uh, where you take a look at uh, Crossley Net Polar's uh, Frederick Wakefield and uh, Tobermory. Uh, and the person that reached out was actually Deborah Fallows. Um, you know, we're obviously big yes. fans of her and uh, her husband, uh, James. And we're big fans too. and love their work. Um, had them at the Jefferson a couple of times. One of their digital programs is available on our website at jeserie.org. And of course, we had them here for the Global Summit, uh, um, Global Summit 10. They're, uh, you know, gave them keys to the city. They're honorary citizens. So we have to visit Deborah's hometown vicariously through your writing because when she reached out and said, you know, I just think you might find this of interest because she grew up in Vermilion, Ohio. I said, I wonder if anybody knows because there happened to be an eerie connection. If anybody knows this, it's going to be David Frew. I sent you uh, this article and you, you turned around and, and created a, a piece of your own telling us the history about it. So tell us a little bit about that small world there, David. Well, uh, the, the fellow that, uh, that she was talking about, his name was Wakefield, if I recall correctly. And he was a yachtsman and he had a yacht that was too skinny and it would roll vigorously in the uh, in the cross waves uh, when he was trying to go someplace. So uh, I think I think there's a picture of it in the article. You immediately look at that uh, that the yacht and you think, oh wow, there's there's too many people on top of that and it's it's not beamy enough to be stable. And he finally decided he had to get something more stable. And there was enough commercial fishing going on in Vermilion, which is uh, past Cleveland. Past Cleveland? No. Yes, yes, on the other side of Cleveland, between Cleveland and, uh, and uh, Cedar Point, uh, for perspective, a beautiful little port. Uh, he was groping around looking for, say, he wanted to build his own yacht, and he, he ran a brass fittings company. So he had all the technology and the horsepower to do the fitting out of a yacht. He wanted somebody to build him a fish tug that would be stable and fast with a diesel engine, because he wanted a diesel engine. He knew that that was the smart way to go. And he couldn't find anyone to do it because fishing was uh, worth the peak of fishing. People were saying, well, two, three years from now, we could do it. So uh, he comes to Erie, Pennsylvania, and he's introduced to the Crosley Company. Uh, they're famous for in having invented a gizmo that you can mount on your boat that pulls gill nets in automatically, Crosley net puller. In fact, we have one in Erie. When Jerry and I were, uh, were conspiring on things we should have in our collections, he was on the board and I was running the Historical Society. We found one and got it. And as far as I know, it's in Girard waiting to be restored or whatever. It's an incredible piece of history. You take the front end of the bull net in it and tuck it and you turn this on and it will bring in, you know, a quarter mile of gill net. Gill nets are so long that that's unimaginable and they're heavy. And as they come in, you pick the fish out of them and toss them in ice. And uh, uh, the Crosley Company, uh, had, they had to cannibalize their market. You only need one. And once you have one, you're done. Uh, and they were looking around for other things to do. So they started to advertise themselves as a, uh, the Crosley Net Puller, I think that it was called, and Sheet Metal Company. They were right downtown, right around the corner from Purcell Hardware, which is now uh, where uh, Molly Brannigan is. And uh, Mr. Wakefield found out they were interested in doing a ship for them. He figured they would have the skills and capacity to do the ship. He, he came with his own engine, which was a floor model engine, kind of used in factories to activate ass assembly lines. And uh, that was as far as I know, and uh, Jerry con con confers with this, the only ship that uh, Crosley ever built. It's a it's such a great story, and it, it's one of the many that are available on our website, uh, jeserie.org. And we've been sending these out, uh, David, as you've been sending them into us um, via email too. Um, so you know, folks who are interested in uh, receiving them uh, in your inbox, just let us know, and and we'll get you 
uh, set up of those publications. David, one of the things I really enjoy about your writing is your style. You unpack great history, uh, make it accessible and offer insightful profiles, people, places, and things, but you unfurl great observations with humor and wit that I think really draws people in. I think that's one of the things that I always look forward to getting these. And I'm not just saying that because, you know, here we are in a Zoom chat and we're having a program together. I really mean it. You know, in case in point, you know, a recent title of yours, I, I, I was belly laughing honestly when I got it, which was uh, the title is Building a Shipwreck Exhibit Author Spotted Leaving a Seedy Motel by Most of My Friends. I couldn't stop cracking up. Uh, when it comes to writing, uh, you know, you have a distinctive style, but, you know, I, I like to think, you know, all writers are influenced by someone or some ones that came before them or writing at the same time as them. Uh, who's inspired you most as a writer? Well, I, I don't know that this person was a writer. This person was an awful writer, but I ran into a, a fellow by the name of Dave Stone uh, out on Long Point uh, while I was sailing, I had a sailboat. And um, my family and I used to take off in the sailboat for a month. And people would say, oh, my God, where did you go? Did you go to, like, Europe or uh, up and down the East Coast? And we would sail across the lake, and we would just spend the whole time in the little ports in and around Port Dover, Long Point, Port Rowan. And uh, I was in Port Rowan, uh, and I gave my son and my daughters uh, each 20 bucks to go shopping in, in booming downtown Port Rowan. And my son comes back with a shipwreck map, a chart of shipwrecks of Lake Erie, uh, focused on Long Point, done by Dave Stone. And we thought, oh my gosh, this is really incredible and fun. And come to learn that he was giving a talk about this at the uh, provincial park at Long Point. Uh, so we borrowed a car, we went, to the we went to the talk, and I was mesmerized by this guy. And uh, we became friends. I used to tag along with him in the boat as, as, the, uh, as the, you know, the, the, the dummy that carried stuff, and we'd be out looking for shipwrecks. Now, what was a turning point for me in my career and thinking about how to do academic stuff was I was a quant, quant kind of guy, uh, doing, uh, doing double-blind research and getting it published in referee journals. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but one day uh, I brought Dave Stone to Gannon to give a lecture, and uh, I was a little worried when he came into the lecture with like seven slide corrals. This is a long time ago thinking, oh my God, this, uh, the, the audience, the, the room was packed. Well, he went on for hours and hours and hours storytelling and people never moved. It was just unbelievable. And I said to myself, you know, maybe I should figure out a way to, to integrate storytelling with the boring stuff I'm doing in graduate school for MBA students. I have to come up with stories to work into my research methods class. He taught me a lot. And uh, I guess I, I, I learned from him that uh, maybe the strength of taking oral history and uh, telling the oral history and writing in written form, I, I guess you could accuse me of that. That's my style, I guess. So uh, it's a great style. And if anything, I've learned from uh, good writers throughout the year is to leave the readers wanting more, leave the viewers in this case wanting more. And, and as I mentioned, all of your writings uh, available um, you know, on our website, jesiri.org. Uh, I'd like to stop there because that takes us essentially through the first half of 2020. And, and like the rest of us, without a crystal ball, uh, I have no clue what the second half is going to bring us. But what I do know, though, is that those uh, several pieces we didn't get to are available now. You've got other ones in the hopper uh, we are working on now on the website. So there's much more to come from you. And we're excited to, to, to have those. And I want to get you back for a conversation to hear some more of those stories. And I'll be able to work through that. But David, before we go, there is a book in the works. Can you give us a quick tease about what book might be coming out that you're working on right now? Because I mentioned you've already written more than uh, 30 of them, 35, I believe, in your intro. Uh, you've got a new one. What's up there, Dave? New one coming, and it's coming as a result of the help that we're getting from Jefferson. Uh, coming up on four years ago, uh, my wife and I were breaking the rules at, the, at Prescott by sitting after dark waiting for the moon to rise over the city. It was the hunter's moon. That's the name of the uh, October moon. Uh, and as we were sitting there, hoping that we wouldn't get rousted uh, by, the, by the park police, uh, Marianne said to me, okay, I know you, you're done with your last book. I had just finished writing the book about the Erie to Pittsburgh Canal. She said, what are you thinking you should do next? And I said, I'm thinking as much as we love this place, I should write a book about Presque Isle. There's lots of interesting 
books about Presque Isle, picture books, and Gene Weir talks about trails, and uh, but there's nothing comprehensive. And there's so many misunderstandings about Presque Isle, and so many times we could have lost it, so many acts of good fortune. Uh, Marianne, who's been the namer of most of my books, uh, I might know how to write, but she knows how to name stuff. Uh, was grinding away and she came up with the title of this book, Accidental Paradise. And uh, you know, one of the fortunate accidents here, when, and we're watching them struggle right now to keep the sand in place so that the, so the Presque Isle doesn't wash away in the offensively high water. Uh, one of the near misses was when Andrew Carnegie thought, uh, gee, maybe I should come here and put a steel mill out there. Perfect place for a steel mill. That was before it came to State Park. If that would have happened and there was loads of people in town that were encouraging that to happen, um, I don't know what we would have out there. A mess. And we don't have a mess. And we have uh, what often is heralded as, as our greatest asset uh, here in, in Erie County. Uh, that book uh, will be out soon. Uh, we're hopeful that it's going to be out in advance of the holiday season. So in the next few months, as we continue to work on that, we'll keep folks updated. Uh, but Dr. David Fru, a prolific uh, writer, speaker, historian, uh, who grew up on the lower e uh, west side of Erie, uh, gave us the definition of Bay Rat, what that means, uh, you know, and, and so many other uh, great contributions, uh, writing, teaching, uh, lecturing. We are so glad to have you for this conversation. So glad to have you helping the Jefferson uh, continue to put out great publications during uh, the COVID-19 crisis and hopefully beyond as we continue to continue to work together. Uh, Dr. David Flew, thanks for joining us for this discussion today. Thanks for having me. It's been great fun. And thanks to all of you for watching along at home. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And of course, for more information on both past and upcoming Jefferson Educational Society programs, as well as publications, please visit our website, jeserie.org. Uh, there you will find all of the amazing writings by Dr. David Frew, uh, my guest here today for this program, as well as a, as a host of others, uh, as well as videos of past productions, uh, past programs that we've had at the Jefferson, as well as uh, announcements for upcoming programs. And of course, uh, for more information on us as well, aside from the website, be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us.